So if you have your Bibles with, with you, turn with me to 2 Peter, 2 Peter 2, 19. The Bible, if you're there, say amen. We have also a more what? Sure, sure word of prophecy. Whereunto ye do well that ye take heed unto a light that shineth in where? A dark place. Unto the day dawn and the day star arise in your heart. So what is the focus of prophecy? What is the focus of prophecy? That we are to take heed. What is the purpose of prophecy for us to get a, such a closer knowledge of Jesus Christ and prepare for Jesus Christ that He not only dawns in our heart, but we shall be ready when Jesus comes when? In the clouds of glory. And the Lord said, um, Peter says, He warns us, take heed, take heed. You see, we live in prophetic times. Prophetic times is a call for a deeper understanding of the prophecies as we observe the prophetic days shorten to the coming of Jesus Christ. We are told that he's even where? At the doors. When someone is at the doors, what do you do? You open the door. You know, we're told that the Laodicean in Revelation 3, God is knocking at every door of people's homes and their hearts asking them but he's not going to force himself into anyone's home he expects us to what open that door and let him in the bible says he wants to sup with us he wants to sit with us you know when's the when in your families do we have the greatest conversations is at the dinner table amen well god says he wants to sit at that table and share he says you're no more uh, servants but your friends. I want to share with you the things of the kingdom of God. But we must let them into our heart. But let us look at the background of this scripture and why I'm sharing this scripture. And I'm sharing this because we're said in chapter 2, read with me, there were false prophets among the people. Even as there shall be false teachers among you who probably shall bring damnation Harris even denying the Lord that brought them in and bring upon themselves swift destruction. The Bible says that many, <clears throat> many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall evil be spoken of. We are living in a time when men, women, teachers are in the church. We've been many prophets. Many are calling themselves prophets. Many are calling themselves teachers. But they're attacking the word of God. They're attacking the sanctuary and the work that God is doing in the most holy place. They're even attacking the testimonies of the Spirit. Many, many in the church are rising up and many are leaving the church. For they have found a new gospel. They found a freedom. Friends, it's a freedom in sin, not a freedom from sin. And so let's look. Look at Second Peter. I want to look at the background to this in Matthew 20, uh, Matthew 16, Matthew 16. You had two fractions in the church, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. You know, the Pharisees were, we could say, maybe the conservative element in the church. They were strict to the law. They understood the laws of Moses, and they followed it very strictly. You know, and I'm not saying we shouldn't. We should follow what God has revealed to us. And then you have the Sadducees. They were more trained in the schools of the Greek philosophies. And they entertained. They didn't believe in the resurrection of Jesus. The Pharisees did. But you had these two groups in the church at the time of Jesus. And they came to Jesus and said, show us a sign from heaven. And you know Jesus in verse 2 said, When it is evening, you say it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be foul weather, today for the sky is red and lowering and then what does he say oh ye what hypocrites you can discern the face of the sky but ye cannot discern what the signs of the time the signs of the time you see they might have had a theory and a form but they had no power the Word of God had not changed their character. 
not change them, and they could not even see who was standing right in front of them. The Son of God, the Creator of heaven and earth. Look, he said in verse 4, O wicked, adulterous generation, seeketh after a sign, and there shall be no sign be given unto it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. And he left and departed him. So what sign was this? Why did he use Jonah? What do we know about Jonah? Jonah was called to preach to who? A wicked city, the Ninevites. What the, the, they have a, you know, the wrath of God was going to fall upon the city. They had been given an allocated time and they hadn't repented. So God says to Jonah, go there and tell them that the time has come. But the sign was that Jonah decided to do the opposite of what God wanted him to do. To give the message. He wanted to run away from it. And what happened to Jonah? We know the story. Jonah was thrown overboard, over the boat, and he was swallowed by what? A great whale. How many days was whale J uh, Jonah in the belly of the whale? Three days. Three days. You see, Jesus was telling them that the, he was standing before them, and that the day, or that the day that in his their day, Jesus was offering them salvation and he himself would die three days on the Friday and we rise on the Sunday. He was already explaining to them. You can see the signs. You're asking for signs, but you don't even know who's standing here before you and that I've come to die. And as Jonah gave a sign, that sign, destroy this, destroy this temple in what? Three days? And what did this, the, part, the disciples do? Or the um, Sadducees and Pharisees? They used this against Jesus at his trial. And they said, well, he said he's going to destroy the temple in three days. But Jesus was speaking about what? Himself. He was going to die. And they couldn't see this. They could not see it. You see, the church at the time of Jesus had the prophecies. The under, you know, they had Daniel chapter 9 explaining the 2300 days they had all the prophecies they had the truth and yet they rejected Jesus today we can parallel this today the Christendom even in the church we have been given the prophecies this church was raised in 1844 October 22 because of a prophecy the 2300 days Daniel 814 then shall the sanctuary be cleansed that gave the last stage of earth's history. We're living in the last generation. So God raises a church, the Adventist church, to give the last message for, to this generation. It is the present truth. God raises a prophet also in the, in the midst of this church to lead this church to prepare for Jesus' coming. But the attack we're seeing an attack upon her writings. Attack upon her writings. But the more you attack upon her writings, the more you attack the scriptures and you're finally, you, um, you're committing the unpardonable sin. You see, Jesus came to this as the kingdom of God is at what? Hand, didn't he? The kingdom of God is at hand. What is he, what was he saying to them? Well, he was pointing them to the prophets uh, Daniel. Daniel chapter 9 and verse 26. An understanding of Daniel 9.26. The 69 weeks or 490 years of the 2300 day prophecy. Which began when? And 457 was to the first 40, uh, 69 weeks was going to end when? In AD 27 when Jesus the Messiah would be anointed for his work. And three and um a half years, Jesus would minister on this earth. You know, Satan hated, hated this prophecy, but he also hated Christ. He would not allow Christ, long, well, three and a half years, the prophecy said that Satan would do all he could to destroy Jesus. In 27 AD, when he was anointed all the way to AD 31, when Jesus was crucified on the cross. In the, remember, in the midst of that week, Daniel said, he shall be what? Cut off. So three and a half day, years, Jesus ministered 
And then the last um, three or days, I should say days, years, three years, Jesus would um, in AD um, 31 die on the cross. And then in AD 34, what happened? The message would go to the Gentiles. God would reject the people. The Jews as his chosen people. And now he would go to the Christians or the Gentiles to bring this message to the world. But many are even denying these prophecies today. That Christ came. That we have a timeline of events. That we have a prophet in the midst of this church to bring the church to that time. Many are denying, even as the Pharisees and Sadducees did that day when Jesus stood there. And then Jesus, if you read the chapter, continue reading the chapter, Jesus emphasizes this bread. You know, it was a miracle because at the same time Jesus is telling the Pharisees this. What happens in that chapter? The, um, Jesus is teaching and he says to the disciples, go buy bread to feed this multitude. But then Jesus uses that illustration and says this. Beware, verse 12, beware of the bread of the doctors and Pharisees of the Sadducees. He says, beware. We need a question. We need to look for ourselves into the scriptures. When someone is teaching before you, or whatever you may hear in magazines or sermons, test it to the word of God. Does it line up for what we've been taught, the landmarks of the truth? If not, they're not worthy to be seen. Now look at Matthew Verses, um, let's look at verses 27. You see, prophecy is closely aligned with the second coming of Jesus. Verse 27, it says, For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of the Father with his angels, and then shall reward every man according to thy, his works. Now look at verse 28. Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste death, Till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Wow, whoa. What is Jesus saying here? Does the word of God contradict itself? It never does. <clears throat> but he's saying here to the disciples, there are some standing here that shall not taste death till Jesus comes. How then do we understand the scripture? Someone raised this in the church a couple months ago. Well, look. Jesus is speaking to the disciples and he says None, someone, some standing here will not taste death till Jesus comes in, in the clouds of glory. Let me ask you, are all the disciples dead? Are all those people during that time when Jesus said that, are they dead? So how do we answer this to those that ask? And this is why we need to know our scriptures. We need to know our scriptures because you're going to get people come and says, well, it says here, so this is the word of God contradicts itself. So we can't really, it's not a reliable source to study the word of God. If Jesus says this, they're all dead. I ask, how do you answer this? How do you answer this? And this is the means that why you study the Bible, why it's so important. Here little, there little. We must allow the scripture to explain itself. And if you want to know the context of this, then all we need to do, go back to where I read the first verse, 2 Peter. Go back to 2 Peter. And let's read verses 16, 17. And this is wonderful. This is the answer. Look at verses 16, 17. The Bible says, For ye have not followed cunningly devised fables, we remain known unto you the power and coming of the Lord. You know, the apostles preached the coming of the Lord. You're not, this is not fables. And look at what he said. Coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesties. Who were eyewitnesses of his majesties? The disciples were. Which disciples? There were three. Look at this, verse 17. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven, we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. Here's the answer. This is amazing, isn't it? Because it tells us that there was three, Peter, James, and John, that were called from the disciples to come and pray with Jesus. And you can read this in Matthew 17, 1 through 11, 9, Mark 9, and Luke 28 to 36. They were called up with Jesus to pray. And as they were sleeping, something wonderful happened. 
Jesus was transfigured into the glory that he's going to come when he comes the second time. He was transfigured in the glory of his father in white. And there stood next to um, Jesus who? Moses and Elijah. Amen. And these three disciples Witness the glory so much that Peter said, Lord, should we make a tabernacle for Moses? Should we make a tabernacle for you? Should we make a tabernacle for... Jesus said, no. So that scripture that we read earlier, that none shall see death until the seed of Son of Man coming, was saying that these three were privileged to see Christ in that glorious state of transfiguration when he shall come in the clouds of glory. Amen? Amen. Amen. That is the power of of prophecy we and then he says we have a sure word of prophecy amen so what God has said before it is going to come to pass we have not followed devised fables brethren and sisters God has raised the church the Adventist church God has raised the prophet and she's given the testimonies. It is no time now to neglect the study of the word of God and the prophecies nor the writings of E.G. White. We need to dig deep and read and study more. Jesus is coming. In fact, she says this. She says in the testimonies, it, is say, it will be Satan's, one of Satan's last deceptions. She says this in Selected Messages. Satan is constantly pressing on the spurious to lead away from the truth. The very last deception of Satan will be to make none effect the testimonies of the Spirit of God. And then she goes on to use that scripture in Proverbs 29, 18. Where there is no vision, the people perish. Satan will work ingeniously in different ways and through different agencies to unsettle the confidence of God's remnant people in the true testimony in the true testimony there will be a hatred kindled against the testimonies we're talking about the spear of prophecy her books her counsels you know desire of ages who's read the desire of ages oh it's one of my favorite books who's read the great controversy from page to page brethren I hope that you've read the great controversy Read it more than once, twice, three times, ten times. Put the CD in your car. That's what I do. I stick it in my car when I'm traveling anywhere. And I keep over and over. I read the great controversy and I'm inspired that Jesus is coming soon. Because every event is coming to pass. Just as she wrote it in that book. Amen? Amen. Just as she wrote it in that book. And yet we have men and women in the church who are now denying that the Spirit of God is in those books. And calling her all kinds of names. You know what happens when you do that? You slowly leave the Sabbath. You slowly go back to your old ways. You go back to maybe your drinking, your friends, or, you know, I don't know. Your dress standard changes. Your diet changes. You have no love for the truth anymore. It just slowly, slowly, that's how Satan works. She goes on to say this. There will be though hatred kindled against the testimonies which is satanic. She goes, the working of Satan will be uns to unsettle the faith of the churches in them. For this reason, Satan can she goes, he's, for this reason for this reason, Satan cannot have so clear a track to bring in his deceptions and bind up souls. In his delusions, if the warning and reproofs and counsels of the Spirit of God are heeded. So as long as you're studying and taking heed to these books, friends, Satan cannot, in the last days, you will not be de um, delusioned or lose your way. I treasure these books. I have these books in my library. Does everyone have the library in their book? Yes, you read them. Read them. I've even, um, friend called me, I, I might have said this before, I always say this. Chris, you want to believe what's in the tip? And this is at Fletcher Academy. I said, what's at the tip? He says, books. I said, can you, Jerry, his name is Jerry Survey, my friend. Jerry, what's in the tip? Can you go in and look at what kind of books? Chris, they're all Spirit of Prophecy books. LNG White books. Jerry, I'm on my way. 
I ran to that tip to see why would you throw these type of books on the tip. And my poor grandma, she had all the books also in her house in glass cabinets. And when I lived with her, I said, Grandma, oh, can I have these books? Or can I have some of these books that you have doubles on? She goes, you can have them as many as you want. Just go through them. I said, why? I said, Grandma, you need them. She goes, oh, no, 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 I won't read those books. I said, Grandma, why? Why won't you read those books? Because, Chris, every time I read, I feel so guilty. I feel so guilty, so I'm staying away from those books. I said, Grandma, if you're feeling guilty, that's a good thing. Because that's the Spirit of God speaking. You know, when you read the writings, her writings, the Tsar of Ages, Patriots and Prophets, you cannot but help to know that God raised this prophet to prepare us for the Jesus when she comes in the cloud, when Jesus comes in the clouds of glory. Even those outside of our faith have read her books and claimed her to be a prophet. I'm thinking about this well-known, you might know the story, this well-known rabbi in Jerusalem. Well-known rabbi, you can read it on Google, how he found the, the Seventh-day Adventist truth. I think he had some persuasion with um, amazing facts or someone in there gave him the book, um, Patriots and Prophets. Anyway, he read this book, Patriots and Prophets, called the, the man who gave him the book and says, I want to meet this Ellen G. White. Where is he? I want to meet him. And he says, why, would you, why do you want to meet him? Well, he was a prophet. He was a prophet. I want to meet this prophet. Because no one can write like this, like he's written, because it's written in a way that only a Jew can write. In the poetry, in the way it is. I want to know who this man was, said this old Jewish rabbi nearing his old age. And you know, the guy said, well, first of all, it wasn't a, a man. It was a little old lady with a third grade education. He was shocked. No one can write this. She's a prophet. Only prophets can write like this. You know this um, Jewish rabbi got baptized. He didn't, he didn't want to tell everybody. He, he would have shaken all Israel up if they had known that this man had accepted Christ in his life. But he had. He accepted Jesus. And in a secret basement somewhere, I can't remember whether it was America, he was baptized into the Seventh day Adventist message. And he died in the faith. Amen? That's how special those books are. How so special? Are we taking time, brothers and sisters, reading them? It is time to get those books out. Steps to Christ, beautiful book. Story of Redemption, all oh, the books. Have we really read them and gone through them and applied our lives to them? If you do, you're going to be ready when Jesus comes in the clouds of glory. Amen? Now, there will be hatred kindled. Hatred kindled. Books of a new order are rising in our Myths now. New books are risen, are, um, are been written. 1888 message has been changed. New books are coming in, denying that God has raised this church, denying the sanctuary in heaven and the work that's taken place in the investigative judgment. We're living in some fearful times, brothers and sisters. But Jesus said this. Now, in the Bible, God has divine templates. Templates. That's, I can't even say the word. Templates? Yeah, templates in the scriptures. What are those divine templates that we might know the prophetic um, picture of what's going to happen in these last days? Can you guys give me some of them? What are these divine templates, prophetic templates in the Bible? I know you should know them. Give me one. Huh? Yes, the sanctuary is a divine template because you get all our doctors in the sanctuary. Okay? Thy way, O Lord, is where? In the sanctuary. But what about Daniel chapter 2? Daniel chapter 2 goes through all the history of the nations to the toes and to the raw kingdom. Isn't that a divine template? Daniel chapter 2? That Nebuchadnezzar, a heathen king, received in the vision, in the gym, uh, dream? That's a divine template. Where's another one? Where's another one? Chapter 11, Revelation, shows the rise of the Adventist church in prophecy. She'll prophesy again. Revelation 13. What is Revelation 13? 
It identifies who? The beast, the, the papacy. It, but it gives a historical, historical account. It shows not only the rise, the healing of the wound, and where it came from, from the, all the other nations, an amalgamation of all the philosophies and all the, you know, everything in that leopard-like beast. But it also says that he was what? Wounded. But he was also to be what? Healed, the Bible says. And all the world what? Wandered after the what? The beast. Are we seeing that today? Is this not a sign of Jesus coming? Look what's happening in America because as soon as you have the, the healing of the wound, who, what nation rises in 1776? America, the lamb-like beast. It rises as a place of freedom for the persecuted that came from England, from all over. They came and a nation was risen, a place where they can worship and have religious freedom. The Puritans had come, the Roger Williams, read those stories. How America, God had found them a, a safe haven for the persecuted here in England that came. But look where America is today. They just voted in President Trump. Oh, the Christians say, the Adventists say, let us put Trump into it. The Christian, he has the Christian vote, the Protestant vote, but he also has the Catholic vote. The Pope went and said, all Catholics should vote for this man. I wonder why. I wonder why. Church and state is about to be the forming of the image of the beast. When that happens, what happens? Persecution. Who do you think is going to be persecuted? Religious freedom will be taken away. Friends, we are living in times, in the times of the end. Is this not a sign? You know, J.D. Vance is vice president. He came out and said one of the first things he wants to do is start enacting these Sunday blue laws in America. This is serious. This is serious. But remember, prophecy, when prophecy is fulfilling, what is God trying to do? Reach your heart. He wants to seal you for heaven, prepare you for heaven as we see the signs. So we see America fulfilling so Revelation 13, no man shall what? Buy or sell, but he that has what? The mark of the beast. What is that mark of authority? Well, Sunday legislation. America, when you unite the forming of the church and state, they will legislate Sunday and enforce it in this America. Now when the enforcement comes up, that's national ruin national ruin. So we have another template, divine template, where we should know this one. This is a beautiful one. We need to study this one. Matthew 24. Oh, how beautiful that chapter is. God speaks about the destruction of Jerusalem to the parallel to the destruction of the world. He says there's going to be rumors of wars. There's going to be nations. There's going to be strife. There's going to be... Um, of famines in the land, there's going to be pandemics, there's going to be flooding. Do we not see this today? Are these not signs that Jesus is coming? Look what happened in Spain. What, two to three hundred people perished? But look what happened in um, America when the hurricane came through. You know, my sons were um, two weeks or three weeks prior to the hurricane. They were at, um, what's the place called, in uh, Asheville, um, where the whole town was wiped away. Um, I can't remember where it was, Chimney Rock. Now I've been to Chimney Rock and I've climbed up to Chimney Rock where there's an American flag, but that whole town has now, it's not there anymore. It's wiped off the map. And my sons, I just were there two, three weeks before it happened. We are seeing vast devastation all over the world. Jesus says these are the beginning of sorrows. Worldwide. And then he says this, in verse 9 of Matthew 21, Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations. Persecution is coming against the church. And look at verse 10. Many shall be offended. They will betray one another. They shall hate one another. You know what brings the offense of the cross? Is that those will not budge from their allegiance to God and the word of God and the truth. People will be offended in hatred. 
Same parallel as the destruction of Jerusalem. False prophets will arise. But there's always a promise for God's people in these times that prophecy is fulfilling. He says in verse 13 of Matthew 20, Those that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. There's going to be a remnant in these last generation. And you can be part of that gener uh, remnant. A remnant that are going to go through the time of trouble. Again, another divine template. Like you said, the sanctuary. Christ is now finishing the closing work of the investigative judgment. When that investigative judgment, what is the investigative judgment about? What is the investigative judgment? It's about character, isn't it? God is preparing our character that we can stand before His Father reconciled. That life of Christ is now infused in us. We've been renewed and restored in the likeness of Christ. It is His garments of righteousness. And we know that this is an investigative. There's got to be an investigative judgment before there's the coming of Jesus. But we know that the investigative judgment started when? In 1844, October 22. And because we're seeing all the signs, we know that Jesus is very near. Then we know that the closing of uh, what Jesus is doing in the most holy place is coming to a close. And then shall Michael stand up. And then there shall be a time of trouble such as never was ever before. God is preparing for this last generation. The parallel is so clear. There's so many divine templates. Where's another one? Can someone give me another divine template? In the Revelations. Well, we could look at Revelation 17. Again, that's just reinforcing what's already in Daniel chapter 2, what's already in Revelation 13. What about Revelation 14? Oh, that's a beautiful chapter. We should know those, that, that chapter by heart. It is a three angels message. Friends, if you want to know the real gospel then you need to study Revelation 14. A gospel that is outside that perimeter of the three angels' message is a false gospel. It is a false gospel. <clears throat> People may come to you and talk about the love of Jesus and the cross. Yes, it's wonderful, the cross. And we need to contemplate the death of Jesus. But when you take it outside the sanctuary, then it becomes more of an emotional experience rather than a deep-hearted repentance and a change of life. And this is why then what's introduced, Satan introduces, is music. You know, this praise, some praise music I do love, some words are really touching. But when they start singing and praising, it becomes so emotional, but it doesn't change the heart. It doesn't change the heart. And this is why I love the old hymns. You know, the, the song you sang today, that appealed to my heart. It showed the mercy of God and His love. But when you have drums and guitars and a frenzy of music and people standing up and praising, you know, there's a, in America, there's a clown. He has a, he has a red hair and big eyes and a big mouth and tattoos all over and he's got these golden glasses or blue glasses and he goes around preaching Jesus loves you Jesus is good for you you know we love Jesus and he dances and clowns and he talks about it. that's not the gospel again it's separated from the sanctuary be careful with anyone that shares a gospel that's separated from the sanctuary thy way O Lord is in the sanctuary right now the everlasting gospel is in the three angels message and it's right now in the most holy place. And it's about character. Character. Whoso readeth, let him understand. You know, who shall stand in that great day? Who shall stand in that great day? You know, there's a divine template through all the scriptures from the beginning. And we have been given the 1260, the 1290, the 1330, you know, 33. All these prophecies within the 2300 days. And friends, it leads right to the point of this generation. Amen. There's no more prophecies. Those prophecies are not again. Time is no longer with those prophetic chart. 
But we have teachers in amongst us that are saying now the three and a half days of the 49 weeks, the, the 2300 days, the 1260 have a literal applications in the last days. No. They have gone away from the testimonies of the Spirit of God. And these are Adventist ministers teaching this. Some are even time setting in our midst. Time setting. And many are following them. Many Adventists. We are literally living in some serious times. And it's a call for a deeper understanding of these prophecies. The day of the Lord is coming. The world is really dark. And Peter's saying that light is still shining brighter and brighter. That day, dawn, or come, and the day star what? Who's the day star? Well, we know the day star. Revelation 21, 22 tells us it's Jesus. Jesus is the day star. Has Jesus arisen in your heart? You see, the things that are coming to pass, these events, it is then no time to get ready and give your life to Jesus. I'm sorry you will not be able to just at that time say, okay, I accept Jesus now. I'll put it off. I'll procrastinate till that, those things are really happening. It's going to be too late then. It is going to be too late. God is appealing to our hearts to now get ready. To now study you see, there's a famine in the land for the word of God, for truth. Even though the light still shineth. Teachers, preachers, false prophets. You know, you know how many false prophets there are? I mean, everyone's calling themselves prophets these days. I get emails from prophets all the time, false prophets. And I do send them back and say, you're a false prophet. Have you passed the test of the prophets? Do you know what the test of the prophets are? Yeah, the Bible, there is a test of prophets. 16 tests, in fact. Do we know what they are? I always share this because it's, it's not funny, but um, I used to have a beard. And I look at some of the, the man came to me. He lived in um, Kittleworth. I can't remember his name. I can't remember his name now. And he came to me. And this is when I first came to England. I had a beard. And um, he came to me and says, Oh, you're a Jew, he said, only because I had a beard. And I just smiled at him and I said, um, no, not a, by flesh, by spiritual Jew, yes. He said, no, you're a Jew. I said, no, I'm not a Hebrew, I'm not a Jew, because I had a beard, I might have a complexion like a Jewish. And then he says, well, I said, why are you saying this? Because he says, I'm a prophet. This is the Seventh-day Adventist saying this. I'm a prophet, he said. I said, you're a prophet? I said, you're a prophet. I said, well, you may, I think you're a false prophet because you just said I was a Jew and I wasn't. He walked away from me. I, I don't think he liked me after that. He didn't talk to me the rest of the meetings. Brethren, we have people rising. We need to be careful. We need to study these prophecies. Go back into your Bibles. Go to Daniel 8.14. Daniel 7. Look at the judgment there. Go to the first book of Revelation 1. All our doctors on the first book of Revelation. Go to... Uh, I, could just, oh, we get, I love the scriptures, amen? <laughs> amen, yeah. Spend time in the Word of God. Spend time with Jesus. Spend time three times a day. Get on your knees and pray and talk to the Lord. All of us, me included, have to put away things in our lives. And we need to pray deeply for the Spirit of God. Any of us can be tempted. Any of us can be tempted. But the closer we draw to the Lord and make those decisions, the closer you will grow in grace. And in Matthew 22, and then we'll be this in closing, a beautiful chapter. It's another beautiful chapter. Jesus talks about um, a parable. He says, um, you know, the king left his servants. And he said to his servants, prepare a big feast. And if you understand in the Jewish, the, uh, the Eastern custom is that when you're invita invited to a big meal or a feast, that the, the host would send royal garments for you to come to wear. And chapter 22 says that 
This, Jesus says um, in that parable, he said, the feast was ready. All had come. All were wearing the right attire. But there was one who did not wear it. One decided to come. Well, I just come. I'll come. But you know, God's eyes, he saw that he wasn't properly attired. He had not the garments, the kingly royal garments. And he was thrown, thrown out of there, gnashing in teeth. But who shall stand in that great day? The question is, will you stand in that great day when Jesus comes in the clouds of glory? Will you be informed, you know, to be forewarned is to be what? Armed. Are you armed in the, the garments of Christ's righteousness, the helmet of salvation, the, on the spirit? We can read this, friends, brothers and sisters. Read your Bible. Get to know your Bible so well that if any man asks a reason of your faith, you can say, here's the reason. Turn to chapter 12. Oh, come on, Chris. There's no 1260. The church is high in the wilderness. Well, the Bible says it does in Revelation 12. We have to answer for the reason of our faith. We have to defend the truth. And nowadays God is calling every one of us to know for our the surety our doctrines. If I come to you, brother or sister, off the street and say, um, you say this, where does this, what are you going to say to them? Are you just going to tell them? Or are you going to show them from the Bible? man came to me when I was preaching in Birmingham. He said, oh, let me tell you why Jesus is the Son of God. I said, oh, show me. He goes to Matthew, and he read me the Scripture, and I was shocked. I had never read the Scripture. But he said it in such a way that my mind was confused because what he was reading was exactly what he was saying to me. And he star startled me. But again, by the grace of God, as we pray to the Lord, he gives us the right answers. And I said, Lord, I, I, he's right. Uh, how do I answer this? And the Lord says, tell him to just continue reading the next few verses. So I said, brother, can you read the next few verses? He was a Muslim guy. He goes, yes. And he looked at me. Oh. And I said, let me explain it to you then. It was the Spirit of God. Because not only was I confused until the Lord revealed it. He revealed it. And then he turned around and walked away really angrily. Same thing happened in Coventry when the last time I was witnessing there. A young, um, a young man, he was one of those um, Krishnas, all dressed in yellow. He goes, oh, he goes, you cannot, you know, you cannot prove that Jesus was the Son of God directly with the, the Father. He says, the Bible does not, there's no, he says, I've read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And I've asked all these Christians, show me where um, proof that Jesus is the Son of God. So I said to this young man, this man, I said, so if I show you proof, then you'll believe. He goes, there's no scripture that you can tell me. So I said to him, okay, grab your, get the Bible. And I'm going to show you some witnesses better than my witness or what I'm going to tell you. If I were to tell you that the Father called His own Son God, would you believe? He goes, there's no scripture like that. Well, is there a scripture like that, brothers and sisters? Is there a scripture like this? So I said to him, read <coughs> Hebrews chapter 2 and read this verse. And I want you to read it out loud because there's a few others there that were just all on his, you know, thinking that he was right. And he read it. And he read it again. Oh, he says, that's just, you, you, you're teaching, you're teaching. And I said, I'm not teaching it. I said, you just read it from the Word of God. It's not my teaching. I said, you just read it. And he walked away angry. He walked away angry. Brethren, we have a sure word of truth, a sure word of prophecy. Put this in your heart. Put this in your mind. That means, stop watching your TV series. Stop watching your TV programs. Stop reading all the books that we're reading. I even have to cut down on scrolling. Because now I realize the more I just go on to, you know, a social media, just evil is coming through. 
set a watch over our eyes and ears. And I pray for every day, Lord, help me. Because it's so easy some days just to go on there and then you, oh, no. Satan's infiltrated my mind. Spend more time in the Word of God, friends. Because in these last days, this is all you will have. But it has to be hidden in your heart because even this will be taken away. This will be taken away. Memorize it and print it in your mind. Carry it with you wherever you go. You know, in my therapy, I teach a lot of my clients who are um, socially anxious or depressed and low and down. I say to them, and some of them are Christians that come to me. A lot of, some, a lot of, a lot of Christians are Jews, even Muslims. And what I say to them is says this, you're always telling me negative things. Your thoughts are always negative. Could there be a possible another way of looking at some situations that you're looking at, other than the way you're looking at it? Well, no, no, no. So, no, 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 no. I said, there is. Let's look at other ways you can look at this situation. But what I want you to do is, this poor young lady, she wouldn't leave her house. She was bullied all her life. Treated really badly in her home. Never loved. She was ugly. She was this. She was, you know, she wouldn't leave her house. She would no way leave her house because she said, that's what people think of me out there and I can't go out there. Yeah, she said, I won't go out there. So I said, let me t tell you something. You engage with these negative thoughts and therefore you will not go. But what if you didn't engage with it? Yes, what has happened has happened. But what if you, instead of engaging with it, which is stopping you from going out, what if you just accepted that this has happened in your life, but you know what? You know, you're more than just what other people did or said or anything like that. There is good qualities, and I promise you there is good qualities. I want you to put those qualities you know that you are. You're quite a kind-hearted person. I knew she was so kind-hearted. I said, put those into your pocket, and when, you, when those thoughts come, I just want you to remember that you have those in your life. You don't have to look at it and just remember. You know, when she did that, she said, okay, I'll try it. She did that. She goes, Chris, you want to believe it? I went shopping. I said, how did you go shopping? She said, well, as soon as I went to the door to get out, the thoughts just came bombarded me. I'm going to get judged and scrutinized. But then I remembered those cards of who I am. And I went shopping. I said, see, it's your attachment to these negative things in your life that keep you from being the person you want to be. Friends, do not allow sin to hold you back. Accept Jesus in your life and His righteousness and then move forward in the righteousness of Christ and then read more of the promises of God and God will do wondrous things in your life. Amen? Amen. And you will be happy. You will be encouraged. You will be strengthened. You will be at peace with God. There's no more um, peace like a river, amen? Peace like a river. And men and women and people will see this in your face. And they'll come and ask you. They'll come and talk to you. God will send them to you. And you can help them in the way into the kingdom of heaven. You know? We may know, you know, by this you'll know that you're children of God because the Spirit of God dwells in you. My spirit and you know, God's spirit, your spirit and God's spirit, that's how you know you're a child of God. And you can cry, Abba, Father, because you're an adopted child of God, amen? And all things that God will give to you. But all you ask is a surrendered heart, a willing mind, and putting away of things that we know. There's no time, friends. Time's coming to an end. Are you ready to see Jesus? I pray, and I keep us all, we all need to pray for one another. But let's pray that we'll be found faithful in that day. Amen? Let's bow our heads and pray.